So we're going we're gonna to start this session with a recitation uh, by Asad Beg, who is one of our student leaders at NYU. And uh, if you remember, he introduced the conference for us yesterday. Assalamualaikum. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم صدق الله العظيم So this session uh, is called Conversations and it builds up off of a program that we started at the IC or we had a pilot program for and we're looking to launch inshallah in the coming months at the IC. The IC is the Islamic Center at NYU for those who aren't familiar with it. That's what we kind of call it as a nickname here. Um, that is called Conversations. And what we're looking to do as we institutionalize and go further in our community development is to begin to focus on creating more entry points for sub-communities within our broader minority community of Muslims. Converts have a very interesting experience in the Muslim community. Uh, and one of the things that I had done when we were trying to establish this program is I met with probably about 30 or 40 different individuals who are part of our community here at the IC who had embraced Islam uh, at a later point in their life just to hear their story. And more often than not, when we hear the story of somebody who converts to Islam, we listen to it in the frame of, tell us why you became Muslim. We hear about this impassioned story where it gives us a real solid boost in our own faith and it lasts with us for a few days but we never hear about what was kind of hard in the process. We never really hear about what was difficult in the transition to the Muslim community, why perhaps it wasn't the easiest decision and how we potentially made it a little bit harder and we feel as if that's a story that needs to start to be heard. Because many times, whether we're conscious of it or not, we alienate and ostracize many individuals in our community. And converts are just one of many of these subgroups, and it's not to distinguish and alienate and further cause isolation, which one could argue I'm probably doing by putting a panel of converts on stage and letting you stare at them. <laughs> But, you know, <laughs> whatever, I'm not a convert. <laughs> and so the way this is going to work, 
um, because we have half of the audience on the stage, instead of giving them the opportunity to speak, uh, you know, and share their story, it's going to be kind of a more guided question format. And what would be ideal is that if you all have questions and want to participate in the discussion, you can either write your questions down and send them up to me, or there's two microphones in the front of the room. Uh, you can come and ask your questions there. And you can do that at any point in time, right? But we want this to be a very open and frank discussion because we have to internally start to deal with some of these things so that again we can build healthier and more vibrant communities. Not just places that are built on very cursory interactions, very superficial relationships, but where we actually understand the lived experience of the other, even if the other happens to be a Muslim. And so we need for you all to be engaging here as well. Otherwise, it's just going to be me asking questions, and that's going to be really boring, right? Because I have a very monotonous voice, and, you know, nobody really likes to hear me talk anyway. Um, so what we're going to start off with, uh, and if you're on the webcast, you can tweet questions via Twitter. And we'll try to get those answered as well. Use the hashtag ICNYU2011. You know, there's only like four people who've been doing this, by the way, right? <laughs> there's like 600 people bought tickets to this conference. And we have people like all over the world watching this thing. But nobody is using this Twitter thing. So please, just somebody send a question via Twitter. It'll make us all very happy. And we'll make lots of da for you. <laughs> Even if you're in the audience. Even if you're in the audience, just do it. Just do it so we'll, we'll feel good about ourselves. So we're going to start off um, just starting from Ray, who's sitting to, to my right. Uh, you know, they're going to introduce themselves in just a minute or two so you guys can get a feel for them. Um, and, you know, I know we talked about this before, but what's going to be really important for you all on the stage and engaging this audience is that you're very open and honest in what you're saying, right? It's not like a free-for-all or no-holds-bar type thing, but don't hold back and let things be very, very open so that we can, in a very healthy and safe forum, be critical of ourselves so that we can start to move forward on some of the, the issues that we have in front of us. You know what I mean? All right. I'm going to say you know what I mean a lot, too. There's certain things that I say a lot, and like, like a lot. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Fadl, go ahead, please. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, <clears throat> anybody who knows me knows that I like to say something before I say something. So before I tell my, my story about my, my um, accepting Islam, I want to say, I want to acknowledge first of all that even though that we're a panel of people who accepted Islam, um, that I, I want to recognize that a lot of the things that, that we have gone through in the stories that we'll tell are going to be very similar to those people who, who lived in Islam their entire lives who were born Muslims. Um, and I say that because I get people who come to me who are born Muslims and those who have accepted Islam as adults or as children or what have you, and they all come sharing the same stories. And they all come talking about the same things, about you know being distant from Islam, or not practicing Islam, and then growing near it, or, or transitioning closer, deeper to Allah, practicing Islam more, but their families don't practice Islam, and their families, they get a lot of conflict with them, or they're practicing Islam in a way that's different from, let's say, my country or my culture, and they say, I want to stick with Quran and Sunnah, and this I don't know from, from Quran and Sunnah. I don't know a hadith that says you do this, and I don't know anything in the Quran that says you do that, and they get in trouble with their families. So I just want to acknowledge that, you know, inshallah ta'ala, that inshallah that will fuel some of your questions too, because I imagine that many of you will ha echo some of the experiences that we have even though we accepted Islam um, and we weren't born into Islam. So with that said, um, just very briefly, um, my accepting Islam was really a lifelong journey. I grew up in a family um, that is, is right now um, half Muslim and half Christian. Um, but during, during the time of... Um, 
the nation of Islam, most of my family was Muslim. And, and, and the people who are Christians now used to be in the nation of Islam. And, and when that fell apart, <clears throat> a lot of people went back to the church. But what you have is the rest of my family going, um, going to a Quran and a Sunnah, practicing Sunni Islam. Um, so, so my entire life I've been exposed to Islam. Um, now with that said, the type of Islam I was exposed to was not necessarily the best example of Islam. Um, and what do I mean by that? I mean that um, where I'm from, your first exposure to Islam is in a gang. And that was my first exposure to Islam. Um, I grew up as a Salam. And as a Salam, we used to fight with the Abdullah. Right? And we would fight with them all the time. And that was how we knew each other. It was really, oh, this is your family and this is your family. And, and we would rob each other, beat each other up, you know, do all of these crazy things. But really under this banner of Islam, we're Muslims. And we take on these Muslims' names. Uh, none of us pray to Salah. Right? Nobody prayed. Nobody did any of that kind of stuff. Um, but, but this was the example of Islam that I had. I want to say, uh, you know, deep until maybe I was a teenager. And, and it wasn't until then I started to meet other Muslims who were a little bit older, who were actually practicing Islam um, and really encouraging me toward becoming a, a better person. And, and it was really through that that I really started to question a lot, of, uh, a lot of my own beliefs. I was a kid. I went to Catholic school all the way up until high school. Uh, then I went to public school. Um, but, but, you know, it was really early on that the seeds of Islam had been, had been planted in me. Why? Because I experienced Islam through the gangs, through the fighting, through the crime. But then I met Muslims who were saying that this isn't really what you're supposed to be doing. This isn't the path you're, not, you, this isn't the path you're supposed to take. This isn't what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects from you. You know, how can you be a better man. And it wasn't until later on in my life that um, actually during my undergrad years, I had really drawn a little bit nearer to Islam. And, and in graduate school, I've been Muslim for a few years now, and I accepted Islam during graduate school. And so it was a major shift between people who had known me um, throughout that process because halfway through I became Muslim. So a lot of the things, going out to drink, um, partying, doing all of this clubbing, and having social um, gatherings, and all that, a lot of that stuff I stopped doing. And, and I want to say accepting Islam, you know, at, a, at, a, at, a, at that stage in my life was something I didn't see coming. Um, what I did see was that my life was slowly starting to change. Um, for one reason or another, I decided, that, you know, I want to stop drinking. I think I drink a little bit too much. I hang out and I party a little bit too much. I think my friends are into some things that I'm starting to grow out of. And slowly but surely, I found myself letting people go. Um, spending less time with people, socializing in very different ways, and I had no idea really why. <clears throat> Which is interesting because at that point where I was living while I was going to graduate school, I actually lived um, across the street from a masjid. So I could hear the event every time I was in my house doing something wrong. <clears throat> and <laughs> it used to make me feel so guilty because I, okay, <clears throat> because I knew, sorry. <laughs> because I knew people were doing something right, right? And, and, and that's what drew me to Islam, knowing that people were doing something right and that I myself had the power to do that. So I think that's it. I'm going to stop now. Thank yeah, you. Man. <laughs> So, if you guys take like two minutes to introduce yourselves, right? I don't know, man, it's okay. You know, I used to be in a gang, I'm not gonna say anything. <laughs> I, already got, I already got shakes of hate mad at me for saying the drive by thing. I got me. Yeah, right. Pow, pow. pow. <laughs> Matrix. Hello. <laughs> Uh, uh, my name is Will Caldwell. I'm uh, a master's student in religious studies here at NYU. Um, I converted about five years ago uh, when I was a senior in college. I, um, I was actually uh, at Hebrew University in Jerusalem uh, studying Hebrew um, when I uh, decided to convert. Um, it's, uh, it, there's, there's always a question in my mind as to exactly how that happened. I'm not too sure. Um, <laughs> the best answer I've ever heard to, like, why did you convert, um, was given by Sheikh Abdul Hakim Marad. And uh, he said it's simply because, you know, Allah is very generous, he's very kind. Um, 
And I think that's always exactly the right answer. I, I can often tell you about the circumstances around why I converted, uh, what was going on in my life around that time, but as to why or exactly how, um, I, I'm often left without words. So um, for now, I think I'll just leave it at that until we get into more of the details and the circumstances of how we converted. Thanks. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. My name is Gareth Bryant. Contrary to what you see on the label, Musa Bryant. Musa is what people call me. Gareth is my name. So, I became Muslim when I was 15. And this um, reversion happened in a time when I'm, in my life when <coughs> I had a lot of um, low self-esteem issues. My father had died when I was eight. And there were a lot of things that happened in my home life that were volatile, that as a young person without a father, I wasn't really... I didn't have the tools to deal with it. And one of the things that I was looking for was, um, how should I say, validation just of my own existence because of certain things that were happening. And one thing that I can say is that, I can honestly say thinking back, is that Allah always protected me just by virtue of the fact that he made me Muslim. And one of the ways that he chose to protect me is that I never had any like atheistic concept. I always believed in the oneness of a God. It's just that I didn't know how to please him or worship him properly. And I grew up in a Christian household, but many of the things referring to the theology of Christianity, I saw as like utter nonsense. And I was always like a free thinker. I'm like, mashallah, I was a free thinker. So I would ask different questions like on a theological <laughs> level, and people were never able to give me the answers that I wanted or needed. They weren't able to give me the right answers flat out because there are no right answers. So that was one of the main things that propelled to serve as a catalyst for me to become Muslim. And there were a lot of things that happened in my life like during like high school, my high school years, because unfortunately I wasn't very religious. And there were a lot of things that happened in my life that made me really, really reflect about which directions in my life that I should take. Like for example, like being shot at. Like once you're shot at, like that's something that really makes you think like I need to really like go back to the drawing board and like think this thing over. So that happened to me a couple of times and mashallah it hasn't happened since so I must be doing something right. <laughs> so without further ado I'm going to pass the mic to my brother Jay. My name is Jay Dobby. I became Muslim four years ago. I uh, came from a Hindu background, a Hindu family. I uh, grew up trying to find God and trying to figure out religion and I uh, was trying to practice Hinduism as best as I could and then I couldn't find the answers from my family or by reading books. It was very confusing for me. So then um, I hopped on a plane and went to India for the first time so I could see it firsthand and um, I came back even more lost. So then I started um, reading, well I'm, my background is I'm a DJ and a music producer. So I used to go to this record store since I was like 14 years old and the, the guys that run the record store are Muslim. I didn't know that. So then I started telling him, yeah, I just came back from India, and I'm lost, and you know, so he's like, oh, here's a Quran. I was like, wow. So he gave me a Quran, <laughs> and then the Quran is sitting on my table. I didn't really open it. It was on the side of the table, and I knew some of the rules, like, you know, keep it at higher level and don't put it at low. So I would leave it there, and then one of my friends who's not a Muslim came over one day. He's like, yo, bro. What you do with that book? And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, don't read that book. People who read that book convert, man. So, <laughs> so, so, so from then, I just, I was like, wow, what's so powerful about this book? So I started reading it, um, and <laughs> slowly and surely, and I mean, I'm gonna fast forward because you asked a convert how he converted, and we'll just talk your ear off. I'm telling you. So, um, fast forward, I, I. I came across the ICNYU podcasts, and then I, would, I noticed that instead of being listening to music on my iPod, I would be listening to Khalid all the time. <laughs> like, I would listen to his podcast, and then one day I had the courage to just email him and say, I don't know why I'm feeling these things. I just want to meet up with you one day. We finally, after m months of trying to uh, fit, our, fit into a schedule, I met him at the ICNYU Old Center, and I just took my shahada right there. Wow. <laughs> We'll get into more in the future. 
So really, really quick, when Jay came to take his Shahada at the IC, um, I actually used to listen to Jay's CDs when I was growing up. <laughs> he, he used to mix Bollywood songs, uh, and his, his name was Little Jay. And I had his CDs, he was like Bollywood's finest, Little Jay, whatever. <laughs> New York's finest. And he came to take his Shahada, and after he was done, I called up my sister, and I was like, I just gave Little Jay his Shahada. <laughs> It's <laughs> like crazy. Inshallah. Sorry, Lisa. <laughs> Hi, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Lisa. Uh, I'm a senior here at NYU. Hopefully, inshallah, graduating in May. Um, I, similarly, similarly to Jay, I was raised in a, I guess, Hindu background. My mom's really Jane, but like, you know, it's like all the same thing eventually. Um, uh, <laughs> oh. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, my parents weren't really practicing. My mom's, exte like, the, my extended family on both sides was more practicing, so I wasn't raised in, like, a religious household. But um, there was this stigma, I guess, of Islam and, like, Muslims that was just kind of, like, not spoken about but understood. Um, and so, yeah, I just grew up with this concept that, like, Islam was just something that was, like, in the world and I should just kind of try to stay away from it. Um, so Islam is really the last thing that I thought I would ever um, be involved with. Um, but yes, um, I was in high school when I started to question my religion. I um, didn't really understand Hinduism and what it was about, and so, like Jay, I tried to like figure things out, but essentially I couldn't find the answers that I was looking for. And then when I got to college, I was even more confused, and I joined our gospel choir. And so I was this Hindu girl singing about Jesus in the gospel choir for a while. <laughs> and that confused people. And then throughout that process, um, in about halfway through my sophomore year, um, I had been like researching things online, and I found Islam, and I was intrigued. Um, and I learned more and more about it. And alhamdulillah, I took my shahada halfway through my sophomore year. And for a little bit, I was a Muslim girl singing in the gospel choir, but yeah, so I'll talk more about that later, inshallah. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name's Peter. Um, I, uh, hey, how's it going? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I reverted to Islam, alhamdulillah, when I was 15. It was about a month away from my 16th birthday and a few days before Christmas. Um, I, I wasn't really, like Lisa, I wasn't really raised in a religious household. Um, my mom's side is Jewish, my dad's side is Catholic, but neither of my parents practiced, and we were basically raised with, like, holiday swear your religion, so like Christmas, that's, you know, Hanukkah, spin the dreidel, um, and that was pretty much it. So uh, I was always kind of curious about religion and, and about God, and, you know, growing up, you know, if I asked my parents, like, what religion are, am I? They'd be like, oh, you're, you're Jewish and Christian. And, you know, it wasn't until I got older that I was like, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so I was like, can't be both. So I started, like, thinking, like, which one am I? Or am I both? Or can you be both? So I started kind of looking into those two religions a little bit more deeply. Um, and I kind of did find a lot, of, a lot of similarities between them. And I, and I was, I was, what I was actually, eventually, to cut it short, what I was really looking for was I was trying to figure out, I believed in Jesus. I preferred the Jewish, uh, you know, version of God, uh, you know, without the Trinity, and I was trying to figure out how to, how those two fit together. I'm like, it's got to work somehow. And, and, you know, I looked at, you know, I'd watch like History Channel shows of like, who is the real Jesus and things like that. And, and no, and they always kind of told him, he's always more Jewish. And I, so I was like, how does this, there's definitely some kind of way that like Judaism and Christianity can fit together that can like work. And uh, one day I just, I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm inshallah going to be a, his, a high school history teacher. One day, inshallah, inshallah. make dua, um, if I can find a job. But I, 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 and I, when I was in ninth grade, I was, I was really into history, and I, was, I started, remember looking in the textbook, and I saw like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam like, kind of grouped together, and I was like, huh, that's interesting. <laughs> there's, there's a third one. So I, I, one day I just Googled. <laughs> so one day I just was on Google, and I literally, I-S-L-A-M, and the first thing that came up had a, had a keyword. One of the keywords under it was like Allah, Muhammad, Islam, whatever, and it said Jesus. And I was like, whoa, what's this about? So I clicked it, and I started reading articles on Jesus and Islam, and I was like, oh, there it is, this is it. This is like, and it was the religion of Jesus and his companions, and I was like, that's, this is, I think this is, okay, this is something. So I, I kept learning for, for several months, and about a year, and 
Alhamdulillah, I ended up taking my shahada at the end of that, at the, at the next, during the next year. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakum uh, khair. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak with you all today. Uh, Peter, apparently you and I are the same person. <laughs> uh, Jewish and Christian household. Um, yes, but the inverse. So my father Jewish, my mother Christian, which makes me more Christian than Jewish. But I won't go into that. Um, yes, no birthright trip, that's right. Uh, what to say? I mean, uh, I converted in 2006. And this is my sophomore year at Fordham University. Which is a, it's a Catholic university. The gist of it is that before I went to college, I took a year off and I decided I was going to look for the meaning of life. It's a pretty tall order, I know, but uh, I still haven't managed to find it. Actually, that's not true, I have, and I'll tell you what it is in a minute, inshallah. Your suspense is killing you, I'm sure. So, I decided I was going to look for the meaning of life, and I went backpacking, I traveled, I worked, I read lots of books, mostly dealing with Eastern philosophy, Taoism, Buddhism. Uh, I read the Vedas, um, but I don't recall them that well. I went to college, and I guess the, just to echo Peter's sentiments, the thing about growing up in a Catholic <coughs> Jewish household is that you sort of walk away with the, with the impression that religion is good, but it doesn't really matter which one you pick. So that was my approach. I figured, hey, I'm at a Catholic university, I might as well just go and speak to these priests because in my quest for meaning, I sought out the, you know, the elders. I spoke to people who had lots of experience, who could shed a little insight on what I was going through. And so I really, and I really, mashallah, I genuinely loved them and benefited from their, from their company. But it didn't work out. I, through what ultimately turned out to be a fortunate series of events, I did not uh, get baptized, did not get um, confirmed. And then later, I was hanging out with a couple of friends, and these guys were Muslim. I mean, like the the remarkable thing is that uh, they they party, right? But <laughs> but they still there's still something about them in the way that they treated each other that that I thought was different, and the fact that they were so um, insightful in certain respects in the way that they could like uncover read between the lines if you will um, really it, it begged the question you know what are they reading so on to the meaning of life I converted the end of the story is that I converted alhamdulillah in, in 2006 as I told you but the meaning of life I learned see prior to my understanding of the meaning of life I thought that once you reach this epiphany you just practically like you know, turn into this cloud of, of dust and, I mean, metaphorically speaking, right? But uh, you'd, you'd reach this higher state of consciousness, and I, this was my preconceived notion of, of enlightenment. And I remember I, I, I was in Morocco uh, studying abroad my junior year, and this uh, gentleman, also by the name of Khalid, came to our school to talk to us about Islam. And he, he mentioned the hadith, I have not cre no, the ayat of the Qur'an, I have not created man and jinn except to worship me. I was like, subhanAllah, that's the meaning of life. And, when, and, and in contrast to what I previously thought, when you learn the meaning of life, you don't just sort of, I don't know, turn into a cloud of dust. I can't really think of a more sophisticated way to put it, but you don't do that, you work. I mean, when you learn the meaning of your existence, you work. So I'm not going to say any more. I'll pass it on to Shabzai. Uh, I actually became Muslim in 1992, so I might be the older, older member of this illustrious, mashallah, committee of fellow epiphany experiencers. <laughs> Uh, I actually got involved in hip hop culture in like 1983. I was young, I was like 11. Um, and I started DJing when I was 14. So I think Jay, you and I have <laughs> the same life. Um, and at that time, as you know, there was much more hip in Islam than there was hop. I mean, sorry, in, in rap music, there was much more hip than there is hop now. Um, and I was exposed to a lot of the cultural elements of 
the 80s hip hop scene as well as the early 90s hip hop scene. I tell people my first Sheikh was Rakim um, and, and KRS One and Chuck D and Paris, X Clan, uh, you know, a tribe, the Jungle Brothers, Zulu Nation. That was the whole kind of vibe that I came out of. And then as a DJ, especially if you had the Technique 1200s, right, with a Gemini mixer, you had to have two copies at least of every record. So I would constantly hear these records like thousand times over, right? All praise be to Allah, and that's a blessing. Poor righteous teachers, assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam, the universal greeting of the people of our kind. These are actually songs that were out there, right? And so we were like, yo, what are these dudes talking about? <laughs> And, and, and then having serious theological questions about Christianity since I was young. Not really being able to believe that God was white in the suburbs, black in the hood, and Latino in another part of town. You know, all these multicolored gods. Um, so I was a DJ for a brother who actually was a member of kind of a pseudo-Islamic cult. We used to talk about Islam all the time. And then I was involved in a gang, the Bloods, Pomona 456 Piru, as Khaled has, you know, I mentioned, but one thing that Khaled, that Khaled doesn't know, and I'm going to keep it under two minutes, is that the guy that I was involved in the drive-bys with was a Muslim, mm. who I went back later on to meet after I became Muslim, and he had already died, right? So we used to smoke weed together, and he would tell me, like, Jesus ain't God, man. Mm. And then I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> And then that's how really I started to actually have a conversation with someone. I'm not encouraging anyone to do that. But that's how I started to hear about Islam and actually be able to talk to someone. And I was like, get out of here, man. Jesus is God, man. Mm. He's like, no, nah, no, nah, here, hit this. Jesus ain't God. <laughs> then uh, at the, I made actually three records. You're not going to find them anymore. Um, <laughs> And I was experiencing some fame uh, with DJing, but empty. I was very empty inside. Mm -hmm. And I started searching. I found a copy of the Quran in the library. I started reading it in the restroom because I was scared that my mother, you know, don't mess with your mama, man, would kill me. And then I went, and now here's the secret about me in New York that's going to tell you something. I went to a flea market, like a swap meet. I don't know if you have swap meets on the East Coast. Um, and there was this guy with this big turban and this white dress. His big beard. So I went up to him. I was wearing all red. I was flamed up trying to catch the girls. And I, I used to sell my, my mixtapes actually there back in the days. Remember mixtapes, Red Alert and Marley Marl and them? So we had mixtapes. So I saw not this whack mixtape. These guys couldn't mix them all to Dairy Queen now. But <laughs> we, we, we went to this guy and I saw him and I was like, man, why do you look like this in Oklahoma? <laughs> And then there was this real beautiful writing. He was selling incense and oils, and he was from Marcy, lived in Oklahoma. So then I was like, yo, what's up, man? I thought he was a foreigner, and he was like, yo, what's up? It was cracking. I was like, man. I was like, how, how did you learn how to talk like that? He said, no, I'm American. I'm from Brooklyn. There you go. I'm from Marcy, Fort Greene, and Marcy, and I moved here. And then he actually was the person I took Shahada with. Mm. Now what's interesting as I finish is I was wild. I mean, you can tell. I was wild. To, you know, fortitude aside, I was wild. <laughs> and he said, man, I used to watch you for like three years sell your tapes, and I used to pray that Allah will guide you, man. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's really how it happened. Alhamdulillah, may Allah reward him. He's from here, from our city. Assalamu alaikum I think I just forgot everything I was going to tell you, so I'm going to wing it. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, my name is uh, Khalid Latif. I'm the executive director of the uh, Islamic Center at NYU. No, I'm just kidding. My name is Cyrus Mangoldrick, and I work at the Council on American Islamic Relations in New York. And, uh, um, you know, my experience might be different than a lot of people on this panel. Um, my family is actually primarily Christian and Muslim. Uh, my father is Irish Catholic. My mother um, immigrated here from Iran and was raised Muslim. 
And, you know, we were raised, I think for them, uh, we were kind of Christian by default. I think the, the urge was to assimilate. And I realized that, you know, the, for them, the, the real love was in worship, was in worshiping God. You know, the, the important thing was believing in God. I remember when, I must have been in middle school and high school, and I used to be so mad, and I would be so mad I had to go to church, and I would complain, and they would be like, well, if you find a Buddhist temple somewhere in Pennsylvania, then we'll go. And, I mean, that wasn't really a reality in Hicksville, Pennsylvania. But the... I think for me, you know, growing up with um, such trust in all faith, you know, and trust in God, um, you know, when I, when I got older, when I was a teenager, you know, I, I lost faith, and I thought I lost faith in God, and I thought I didn't believe in God. Um, and I realized, the older I got, that that wasn't the case, you know, that I believed in truth, and I believed in a truth even, and I believed in God, I just didn't know what it was. And this, this will probably be a story for another question, but uh, actually my... Um, the first time I really expected that Islam could be for me, or that I actually even had that inclination. Because no one in my family ever pr pressed anything on us. In my family we had Christians and Jews and Muslims and Baha'is and Zoroastrians all in my house praying at the same time. And there was never anything weird about that. Nobody ever pressed any beliefs on anyone else. Um, the first time that everyone, anyone ever told me to convert to Islam was, uh, he was an alcoholic five percenter. And, uh, and, and, and it really, it, you know, it really it struck me, you know, because at the same time he was doing what he was doing, but I really saw the importance of the discipline, you know, that, and I think first for me, before coming into Islam, I really had to have a respect, first a respect, and then a sincere belief that Islam as a discipline was a way of life that could make us all better people. And at that point, there was a point I remember I woke up, it was the first of Ramadan, I've been studying for months, maybe years. I've been studying Islam, but I remember I woke up on the first of Ramadan, it was probably 2007. I just started fasting. I just knew it. That was it. Alhamdulillah. Anything else you want to know? Well, I will talk about it later. Inshallah. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. My name is Whitney Terrell, and I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Woo! Woo. <laughs> Um, I moved to New York about two and a half years ago to work in the financial industry. Um, but my experience coming into Islam was kind of interesting because when I was five years old, my dad started getting involved in the nation. So since around that time, like, you know, um, we cut pork out of our diet. Um, and my mom was still Christian, but, you know, I still was exposed to Islamic, like, principles. And I think the respect that I had for Islam or um, <coughs> Islamic like institutions uh, came from the discipline that the men had. Um, there was this like remarkable transformation in the community because um, you know people just had our community just kind of had this you know facelift almost through the nation for all of its good and whatever. Um, and I even had like a Muslim name at that time. So I think later on, even though I went to, I continued to practice Christianity, um, uh, studying the Bible really deeply in middle school, there's this point um, that I remember taking on a personal motto, which was to seek truth, beauty, and goodness in all things um, in middle school. And then um, I, ha I started having a lot of questions because we had Bible <coughs> study in school. And my questions about the Trinity weren't being answered. I, I wanted to know, where can I find the word Trinity in the Bible? Like, I just want to see the word. And um, just something simple like that. And I thought, um, there's this one gospel song, actually, that stood out for me um, that basically said, like, God will do what he said he will do. He's not a man that he will lie. He will come through. And I was like, this is a gospel song that you're singing. Like, this doesn't make sense. And there were a number of times in church, like, I tried, like, even when things didn't make sense, I would try to go and, like, sit and listen. And um, I just wanted to get up and, like, walk out. I was like, this just does not make sense to me. The choir's, like, praising. Sometimes you say God. Sometimes you say Jesus. And... Um, so eventually I got to a point where I just felt like overwhelmingly compelled um, to that there was just one God and uh, yeah I just was kind of like I'm like a no-nonsense person like once I accept something as a truth like I just uh, you know that's it you know like I so 
Um, alhamdulillah, like I called one of my friends and her family was really influential um, in high school. Um, I was like the Christian student on the Muslim Student Association in high school because we were really cool. So I was like, you know what, I, I love you, so let's go, like let's check it out. So, um, you know, like the Miss competition, um, so they had the first one in Maryland like while we were in high school. So we did that and you know, I was sitting there like basically learning about Islam like through her family and um, they, they were a model example to me. Like I felt like there was some kind of like peace in their family that um, it was just amazing. It was beautiful. Just how they treated each other, um, prayer, just very loving family, period. And to this day, like when I go to Maryland, like it's extremely emotional to see them. Hmm. Well, now it's hard to start. <laughs> well, hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Megan Putney. I'm, I'm the program director of the Muslim <laughs> Consultative Network. Uh, so I come from a Republican family. Uh, let me start off with that. And uh, so. Uh, I grew up, um, you know, with, with, with my Republican family, and, and yes, hello, Mohammed, I hear him yelling my name up there. Um, so I uh, went to South Korea to teach English, and I had the fortune to meet uh, eight Pakistanis and one Sudanese that ended up being really close friends to mine. And uh, it was a phenomenal experience. We would all have tea together, and just uh, the way to describe these uh, young women and men was that, you know, whenever I'd walk by, they'd come out in the hallway and be like, Megan, Megan, come, come have tea with us, you know? Come have tea. And, and I just always felt included. They always made me feel included. And I remember that that's what really got me, like, interested in learning, because I was like, these people are phenomenal, subhanAllah. And it just, it got me to, you know, crack open the Quran and, and start uh, learning about the deen. And uh, alhamdulillah. You know, I, I, I said my Shahada five years ago tomorrow. Uh, well, I said my Shahada actually on a PIA flight from uh, Karachi to Lahore, but I said it to myself, <laughs> and so I redid it again in February. So, that was a little story. Make it. Thank you. That's the, we used to fly PIA when I was younger, and. It really makes you remember God when you find it. So, right now is kind of where our conversations usually end when we're dealing with people who have converted to Islam. We do a panel, we call it From Darkness to Light, come here, the stories of conversion, all these kind of things. But then we don't ever take it a step forward. Everybody feels really good right now, right? Like you feel it inside, you know, you, you have this just really cozy, warm feeling. But then we never take responsibility for what comes after that conversion story. We don't really ever hear what it feels like in terms of the transition, how it's hard to give up habits and lifestyle decisions. We don't really feel like, you know, what it feels like uh, in the same sense, even if there's parallel situations being born in a Muslim family is very different. Companionship, how do I find a spouse? People tell me that it's great that I converted and then they never talk to me a day after that in the masjid. I'm never invited to people's homes, these kinds of things. It's all real. And so what we want to kind of do before we take questions from you all, uh, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you, you're a big man too, so if you want to say something. <laughs> Ibrahim used to be a linebacker, and you know, I'll, I'll put it out there, Ibrahim used to be a linebacker at the University of Rhode Island, right? So I have all these large men who I'm always like telling to do things, and I feel like one day one of them's just going to knock me out really badly. <laughs> Um, but I'll give you an example, right? And this is, this is an example, and I want you to think about it. When Ibrahim was speaking, and he said that he is a child of converts, right? Before that, how many of you assumed that he was a convert? Right? There wasn't only that many people. You're lying. <laughs> and you don't have to raise your hand, but I want you to think about it. 
because we're stuck in these frames that don't really allow for us to grow. This man was born into a Muslim family, but because he's black, many of us would not ever think that. And then that has an effect on his psyche, as well as the overall psyches of everyone sitting here, because we utilize that same mind in dealing with him as we deal with them. And again, I'm apologetic for pointing fingers at you, but you know I love you, right? You know, you people over here, wow. right? <laughs> so, if you guys could start, maybe some of you can kind of let us know, when was the time when you felt, you know, most isolated by the Muslim community? What was an experience you had where you just felt very alone having engaged the Muslim community and you were left kind of in this place where it was like, I didn't know Muslims did this to Muslims. <laughs> yeah, definitely, most definitely. <laughs> um, one of the things that happened to me like from, I would say, when I was still in high school, like I said, even though I became Muslim in high school, when I became Muslim in ninth grade, I wasn't very religious. So I was kind of like a knucklehead. And they, like there was three things that I never thought I would be able to give up, ever. Women, weed, and partying. And that was like a real big struggle for me. And like I would say from like 2000 to 2003, Allah gave me the strength and the courage to give up those things, right? But what ended up happening is that I had gotten involved into a particular community, um, uh, the Salafi community particularly, and I remember that I changed in a lot of good ways, and then I also changed in a lot of negative ways. And when I started to realize that, like kind of like many of the negative things that they basically they're almost like possessing me. And I would like name call people like heretic and innovator and all this type of stuff. And I was just swept up in this whole movement of making people feel less because they don't agree with your views. And Allah had to, not had, but he did. Allah humbled me to a great extent. And I'm grateful for that because it made me reflect on how wrong I was. And when I began to realize that and I began to change for the better, people who were in my circles, they began to turn their backs on me because I stopped being that person who was the name caller, who was saying, oh, you're not good enough because of this. You're not good enough because of that. And there were a lot of things, other things that happened. Like, for example, like I said, my name is Gareth Bryan, right? And I didn't change my name when I became Muslim. And when I learned that as long as your name doesn't have a negative meaning, there's no need for you to change it, I expressed that deeply among people and I received a lot of resentment for it. I remember when I first became Muslim, the whole thing about like wearing a kufi and a thobe and shawakamis, all this type of stuff. I, had, I would wear it sometimes, not wear it sometimes, and I came to the decision that I'm not going to wear those things anymore because it's not Islamically required. When I started to do that, people, like I said, people in my inner circle used, would like say things like I'm a, I'm a deviant or I'm an innovator to the extent where there was a brother in a particular community who actually encouraged people to not, off, not send Teslim upon me when they see me or to give me the cold shoulder when they see me. And to the extent where I remember, it was a Juma khutbah and this brother he gave a khutbah called the etiquettes of the masjid. And <clears throat> One of the things he said that when a, whenever a person comes to the masjid, they shouldn't dress like they're going to a party, right? So this person basically gave the, uh, the, the impression that if you're not dressing like this, the way you're dressing is not Islamically valid or you're automatically doing something that's obscene or haram. And I remember looking at people and they looked directly at me because I was the only person who didn't have a thobe, who didn't have a kufi, and that was further... Uh, 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 um, how should I say, resentment that people felt towards me. So I have a lot of personal experience with people like basically boycotting you or treating you bad and that really hurt the most because non-Muslims had never treated me that way, but Muslims did. So that makes me like extra sensitive to never, um, how should I say, be foolish enough to condemn someone because of their, whatever their level of religiosity is because true guidance comes from Allah and not ourselves. And 
all of us have flaws, all of us have faults, just like the prophet said, and he said, all of the son of Adam are sinful, and the best of the sinful are those who make repentance. And that really sticks with me, and also what he said is that the Muslim is one who protects the people from his negative statements and actions. And a lot of times we oppress people with our ignorance, and we also oppress people with our knowledge. So I always try my best to protect people from my negative statements and my negative actions, and I hope that everyone else can do the same. Does anybody else, anybody else want to answer this question? Um, about isolation? Yeah, father. <clears throat> So like I said, I, I converted to Islam in 2006, and uh, in 2006, I walked away from Islam um, because I remember feeling this deep, deep sense of isolation and, and not understanding what was going on with me. I mean, I had found religion, and so many of my problems were supposed to be solved, and yet, you know, I mean, I, what I experienced, you, you probably, if you haven't heard it, You'll, you might hear from some other panel members, but the things that, that new Muslims go through, um, I'll, I'll let other people touch on it. But it, it basically just got to the point where I sought out the advice of a sheikh, you know, a bona fide sheikh. He studied, and I won't say where, and I won't say where I spoke to him. But I, I told him, I said, sheikh, I'm so sad. What do I do? And right after telling, yelling at someone for sleeping in the masjid, he turned to me and he said, sadness is the result of sinful action. So I said, <laughs> forget this. <laughs> right? I said, you know, forget this. <laughs> um, That's not what you said. <laughs> How are you going to call me out like that, man? Oh. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, what did I, what did I leave my life for? You know, why did I leave friends and a, su a support network for this? To, to be told that I'm a sinner um, before I'm even told, you know, uh, <clears throat> anything of, of relative use. I mean, the first week, I mean, at first, I, t I, I, I you know, when you're, a Muslim, when you're a brand new Muslim, you're like, you know, people say you're like a newborn baby, you're impressionable, perhaps, in the same way. So I took what people said to heart, naturally. I mean, they were Muslim. They would know what they were talking about, right? Uh, and when I was told that I was, you know, I had just converted, I was having trouble waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning to pray Fajr, and when I was told that I was sinful, then, you know, naturally I believed it. So, it, like Gareth said, I mean, information, knowledge, rather, becomes a burden on people um, if you don't have the wisdom and, and knowing when to dispense it. So people overburdened me. I mean, people didn't talk to me so much as they, they gave me piles and piles of books, uh, pamphlets that were in really poor English and just like, um, and this I had, I had traded for, you know, the homily, which I, you know, I found spiritually very moving. Um, and anyway, I'll just wrap it up by saying a lot of the, the a lot of the, um, ideas espoused in these books were really crazy. I mean, they were just, they were not common sense at all. And they, when people would come into my room and then say, hey, I heard you became Muslim, what's this? They'd say, oh. <laughs> um, it, 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 it actually ended some friendships, I mean, right then and there. So Just to also, you know, I'm going to try not to interject, but I talk a lot. As much as it creates an opportunity for us to, you know, find laughter and, and, and kind of that understanding when somebody's talking. And I'm not saying for people not to laugh, you definitely should. This is something he actually went through. And that's what I want you to focus on, right? When he's trying to learn Islam, people threw stacks of books at him that he couldn't really kind of get through. That was his pathway into the deen. So as much as it puts us in a place where we're like, yeah, we can relate to the pamphlets that, you know, have no sensibility in their English and they're an archaic language, whatever, right? This guy, uh, Jonathan, you know, I'll preserve him, was a great man. We didn't help educate him. Like, we made those pamphlets, we wrote those books, and we translated them, 
and we never thought from the perspective, maybe there's going to be a young white guy from Boston who's going to read this one day. Boston. Massachusetts. <laughs> yes. Yes, thank you. We could do a New York City roll call so that <laughs> Massachusetts is Maybe totally blown out the water. <laughs> but we won't do that. But that's what I'm saying, right? Like, as we go through this, like, listen to what's being said and, like, actually listen to it. You know, that was his path to education. And that's really bad of us. And we have to start thinking about those things. You want to say something, Will, on this question? Uh, yeah. I, I almost feel bad. Um, I have a feeling most people didn't know that this is what they were getting into when they came. Um, uh, so my apologies in advance. But um, I think Yahya is exactly right when he said that um, new converts are like babies. Because in terms of... Um, what we understand and what we're susceptible to, uh, that's exactly right. Um, we sort of absorb everything. Um, what's said and what's left unsaid, uh, what, what's done subconsciously. So when it comes to very overt actions, uh, that's compounded ten or hundredfold. Who knows? Um, but uh, for me, I. I felt um, alienated within two weeks of uh, converting. Um, so when I got cut off from them, that, that was a big deal. And uh, the reason I got cut off is it became apparent very quickly um, that the guy who was sort of taking the lead in teaching me how to pray, um, you know, teaching me some basic Arabic, it became clear that uh, he was interested in more than a friendship more than a, a student-teacher relationship. Um, and when I sort of tried to push back on that, um, and he wouldn't accept that, what ended up happening is he sort of poisoned the well for me. MashaAllah, my friends were very supportive. But in terms of understanding um, what I had just done in converting to Islam, there was, there was no one there who uh, was capable of understanding. Um, and the point of me telling you this is that that set the traje trajectory for the next two to three years of my life. Um, that uh, it, uh, the, the reason I stayed, I, I guess I could say, the reason I decided to remain Muslim was almost out of resentment for um, uh, the people who didn't help me. Um, it wasn't until I came here to NYU that I actually found a healthy community and started to sort of uh, rehabilitate my relationship with Islam um, from one that was uh, motivated by resentment and uh, uh, anger to, to one that was actually based on uh, healthy relationships with people. Um, the role models that I met here um, completely changed the course of my life. And if there's, if there's one thing I could say um, to all of you and you know, to everybody on this panel, it would be that uh, role models are so important to someone who is in every sense uh, regarding the Dean, a baby. Um, we need to absorb all of the positive energy that we can. And so um, having a community that provides that is absolutely important because I can tell you that uh, it, it can ruin uh, your life for quite a long time uh, if you don't have that. So, thank you. So, Jay, Jay and then Peter, and then we'll kind of move on in the discussion. I think um, one of the most like when you're the most sensitive or the most fragile is right after you take your shahada because it feels like a thousand pound weight is off your shoulders and you feel amazing like you want to run through the streets saying I'm Muslim you know but uh, after that you're kind of lost like um, I would have to like go to Google to figure out how to pray or finding different rulings and then on top of that I mean you know born and raised in America we're grown up with like 
the way Americans have grown up. I mean, there's alcohol, there's, you know, I'm a DJ, I'm in clubs four nights a week. Um, and, I mean, you guys are born Muslim, a lot of you. How many of you can go into a mush and say, tell their mom, um, mom, uh, how do I stop drinking? Like, you know, so imagine us converts, like, how do we make this transition now? We know it's bad, and we know we want to get to that point, but the hardest part is who do you talk to? And we, I mean, I had nobody to talk to. I kind of had to talk to Allah and say, Allah, guide me away from you. You guided me to Islam, help me away from all this bad stuff, and alhamdulillah, you know, alhamdulillah happened. But I think um, right after we take our shahadas, when we need to, because, side story, I go into the masjid, and if I tell them I'm a convert, They'll take me to the corner, oh brother, sit down, sit down, tell me, tell me, oh, you know, and they make dua for me like I have special powers. I don't have special powers, you know? <laughs> I need help from you. <laughs> so, I mean, I, you know, if you see a convert, help him out. <laughs> um, so, very negative experiences, and uh, I just kind of wanted to bring up, I mean, alhamdulillah, I didn't, I don't think that I can remember I had uh, any really seriously negative experiences with Muslims, like directly negative. Um, but I think a problem, an issue that's that's an issue for all converts, I guess, is is that even if there's not a specifically negative issue, it's it's not that Muslims are doing something bad; it's that they're they're not, they're not doing anything, because um, it's really it's really lonely as a, as a as a new Muslim, especially in the beginning. Um, and I think like the be the most like obvious time is like suhoor, like you know, like waking up and it's like your whole family's asleep and. You're like in the kitchen making noise <laughs> and like eating like yogurt and like Cheerios or something for Zahur and you're just like, oh, it's kind of dark out. I don't know. So, you know, I mean, oh my God, you know, I'm sure a lot of people also have that same experience, but, you know, it's, more, it's really, it's very, it's, it has a much more of an effect on you as a, as a revert. I mean, not even that it was such a negative thing, but it was, you feel lonely. Um, and, and, you know, everyone around you, your family and stuff, and your friends, and there's, you don't have a Muslim, you don't, you, most people don't have a Muslim community or, or a group of Muslims that, that they can even relate to. You know, if you're, if, you're, if you're raised in Islam, you have your family, at least, you know, that there's, there's more Muslims around you. There's someone who, okay, at least this person, like, has a similar, like, view of reality as me. But, like, at least for myself, like, I felt like I was in the twilight zone half the time. You know, because everyone sees the world very differently than I do. Um, and it's, it's, it's troubling because then you're like, well, maybe there's something wrong with me. Why, do, why am I the only one who feels this way? How come nobody else agrees with me? Um, so, inshallah, like, you know, I think, I'm sure we'll talk more about this, but we really do need to um, create more resources for for new Muslims, and even like you were saying about like going to the sheikh, like you know, with drinking and stuff like that. Like, I think we've talked about the, we talked about this in some of the other um, panels about the, the disconnect between like the scholars and, and the community, and, and how we need to um, have a better like com com communication with our imams and stuff. Um, and we all know about that, but for reverts, I think at least for myself, I kind of assumed that I was the only one who didn't. Like, I'm like, oh, oh, these people are all Muslim. They all know exactly, like, who to go to and wh where to answer these questions. And I'm the only one who doesn't know wh what to go. So I'll just figure it out on my own because I don't want to bother anybody. So, so you guys referenced, a couple of you, a need for certain resources for new Muslims. I mean, what specific resources do you think would be valuable that are established and forged within the Muslim community? Uh, Aside from educational institutions, so we see a tendency for resources and services to primarily be, this is how we teach you how to pray, this is the fundamentals of your faith, which are essential and they're valuable, but moving beyond that, what are other things that you think would be helpful for, for you all? Um, I, I can say that the internet is both a blessing and a curse in terms of resources um, because you can find uh, anything there that you need and you can learn quite a bit. Um, so in that sense it's very useful but um, I think uh, something very valuable is the ability to be able to learn from a human being. Um, you know, I, I learned to pray uh, from instructions I got on the internet and that that was incredibly helpful to me, um, but at the same time, having a person there who can show you what to do, who can guide you, who can make corrections, um, humanizes 
uh, the entire process of learning. And I, I think especially uh, in that th those first uh, few months, first years, uh, that's incredibly important because um, more than anything, I mean, we need to learn, but we also need to have that sense of community as well. And learning from people uh, provides both of those. I also, I also think it's important that um, people have a good social circle. So while the dean is like obviously, you know, foremost, um, it's really challenging to leave everything that you were before. So obviously, you know. I'm not going to totally like change my personality, but sometimes your families think that you've like betrayed them. So they, in so many ways, like it's important for us to remind our parents like we're still your child, we're still your sister, or our families, you know, we're still your relative. But then at the same time, like we need affirmation from <coughs> in a different way that gives us the courage to interact with them and to share our faith. So sometimes just doing simple things, fun things with your friends who are converts, um, it normalizes Islam. Like everything is not about going to the masjid or, you know, it's obviously like you can go to dinner with your friends, you can go shopping, like it, it just, you, you don't give up everything when you become a Muslim. So just offering something simple like inviting someone to your home like that's a really important space especially if you don't do anything outside of the masjid like I've learned so much through living with other Muslims that I can't learn through reading a book for example so just share your home with people share your family So one last question from my end, and then we'll, we'll open it to the floor, um, so Ibrahim doesn't beat me down. Uh, how has it been in terms of finding companionship? Because more often than not, you know, I deal with a lot of people whose families are just not approving of who they want to spend their life with, who they want to get married to, etc. Uh, and it doesn't really seem like there's a consciousness that when you leave your own kid hanging, you're also leaving somebody else's kid hanging. And what that might mean in the absence of a family structure or a support system and some of the other resources that you all have been talking about. So in marriage in specific and also just companionship in general, what, is that, what has that been like for you all? I guess I'd, I'll start if nobody else Let's take the mic. Um, one of the most difficult things to give up, as uh, just to echo what Gareth said, was companionship. I mean, uh, that relationship, a relationship that I had before I, I became Muslim that was uh, nourishing. Um, you know, I don't need to tell you all what relationships are like. Um, but it was something that was very dear to me and that was definitely the most difficult thing to go without in these past, uh, what, six years. Um, but alhamdulillah, the, the advantage has been that I've had to search for meaning in, in myself and in other things and I've had to find patience and happiness and contentment and strength and all of that. Um, by myself, which has been completely worthwhile. But to answer your question, I mean, I've, I've experienced, uh, I think most people have. I think you, you've, you've met someone that's interested you and uh, it doesn't work out because one side, uh, the parents on one side or the other don't approve. Um, because you don't come from a particular village in a particular country or you, you know. Uh, and it was it was pretty difficult at first, but I mean I'm grateful that I I didn't get stuck with in-laws like that. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, thank God I, I didn't have to marry into a into a family that would never look at me as good enough um, or deficient in some way. So while I do, I mean I have experienced it. I, I guess. Alhamdulillah, I've, I've found some sort of resolution. I've found some sort of peace with that. I'm not saying it's as simple. I'm not saying it's simple or easy. But um, I don't know. I don't really know how to conclude. I can say something. Sorry. Yeah.
Assalamu alaikum. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ladies first. Ladies first. <laughs> um, so my family is a uh, half Jain, half Hindu, um, and everyone has married somebody of the same religion, same color, um, and. So my family, I'm actually the oldest girl, the oldest child, I guess, of all my cousins and everyone. So I have a lot of pressure for my family in terms of marriage and like marrying a good Hindu boy. Because my extended family as of right now still has no idea that I'm Muslim. My immediate family knows and it's still very difficult with them. So I actually have yet to tell my extended family, which is also um, a struggle that I'm somehow going to try to work out, uh, inshallah, very soon. But um, it's difficult when I go home and I see my extended family and I have uncles telling me, you know, talking about my wedding already and the guy that I'm going to marry and I'm I don't know who he is and like, <coughs> who are you talking about? Like, and they're pressuring me into this marriage that they think is going to happen and I f feel terrible because I feel like I'm crushing a dream that they have had and have planned for me. Um, as like the role model for the rest of my cousins that are all younger than me looking up to me. And my mom, who is the most important person in my life, consistently reminds me of this. And she tells me, you know, you're the oldest. You're supposed to be the role model for the rest of your cousins. And now, you know, look, what are they going to do when they see this? How is everybody going to react? And, you know, just for my mom alone, who's like the most important person in my life, it's very difficult to hear that. And uh, to have her feel like I have betrayed her or that I don't love her because I've, you know, converted to Islam. Um, but I would say in terms of my extended family trying to figure out my future for me or having this like dream of what it would be and not having the courage or like the ability to tell them yet that you know that's not really how it's going to go is uh, very difficult and uh, you know inshallah may Allah give me the strength to overcome that oh, and man. accept it. Ibrahim you want to ask your question? Huh? So my question is really simple, and people, different people have answered parts of it. Um, for those of you that have made the transition, what, and, and lived very different lifestyles, particularly those that were like rowdier, um, <laughs> you know who you are. Uh, <laughs> um, the, I'm very curious specifically. Now, a lot of y'all have been very good about, you talk about what you talk about, and then you speak in these lovely platitudes. I'm not interested in the lovely platitudes. I'm actually interested in, in specifically the conversations that happened between those friends that you had to let go. And what, how was that, what did that, like what happened there? And how do you reconcile that? And, and maybe even some of the, the new ways that you had to create friendships, and how did that develop, inshallah? So just, just to let everybody know, we're going to extend this session uh, a little bit, so please bear with us because the, the conversations are important. Um, with my friends, um, they saw a gradual change. Like, I wouldn't, they would ask me to go out, and I'd be like, nah, not tonight, not tonight. And I kind of like, I didn't mean to blow them off, I was just wasn't interested. And then I just wouldn't want to hang out with them. And I, nothing against them, I just don't want to be in those type of environments. I just saw that it was, you know, it's not worth it not to be there. So uh, slowly and surely, um, they came, I got married last year. So they came, uh, <laughs> I got married to an Egyptian girl. <laughs> so um, they came to the wedding and they were like, okay, so, you know, in, in the Hindu ceremony, they have a john where they have like a horse and we go out and start dancing in the streets. Um, so they were ready to, they're like, oh, when is that going to happen? So I was like, oh, I think I should just tell them. I never told them I was Muslim. So then I just told them, I said, oh, by the way, guys, um, I'm Muslim, huh? <laughs> but then I, I really wanted them to know that it wasn't because of marriage. Because a lot of people think that when a convert becomes a Muslim, it's because of marriage. And a lot of times, it's not the case. Con becoming Muslim comes first, and then you want to find yourself a nice Muslim wife or husband, right? So, um, and also in my family, it was the hardest thing for me to tell them. I mean, I hit it, I hit it. And then it was, I was about to get married soon, so I wanted to tell them before I got married, so I knew they were going to find out anyway, but I don't want them to think that, I don't want them to resent my wife, saying, oh, look, she turned my son into a Muslim. So I told them before I got married, and um, 
but that's a whole different, that's, that was a hard thing. My extended family like hers doesn't know, um, but now I changed my profile on Facebook to Islam, so I think they're going to find out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, um, so when I told my friends that I'm Muslim, it's funny, I would think that they would bombard me with questions. No one's ever brought it up, and they've never asked me anything, and I feel like now I'm the other. I, I, there's like a wall now. It's not like, we used to be so tight. I mean, flying to different cities, hanging out for years and years, and now it's, it's not there anymore. I don't know why. I'm the same guy. I'm just not drinking with you. I'm not partying with you, but I'm the same guy. But I don't know. It's weird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we had a, a couple of questions written down. Is somebody trying to talk? Who's trying to talk? Me. Oh, my bad, man. Sorry, please. Um, referring to Ibrahim's question, I would say referring to like letting friends go. I had like um, people kind of viewed me as very, being kind of hypocritical, because like I said, when I became Muslim, when I was really young. I was like, I was like the whole party scene, girl scene, like drug scene, whatever. And like I would kind of like try to like. Like basically one of the things that I would try to do is like I would try to be like partially Muslim one day and like on the weekend I'd be like a weekend warrior or something like that, right? You know what I'm saying? Like I just had this whole routine. Like I go to Webster Hall, catch a movie, catch a movie, go to Webster Hall, all types of crazy stuff, right? But then like people <laughs> <laughs> too much info. <laughs> but yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> so when I used to like like dip and dab, so so to speak, people would like actually call me on it. Like, wait a minute, are you supposed to be Muslim? And you doing this and you doing that? And that was another humbling experience. Like, I had to make a decision. Like, who was I going to be? Like, what type of life was I going to lead? And um, that really like stopped me in my tracks. So I had to say, like, listen. I'm at a crossroads right now, and I don't want to be a hypocrite. Like, I don't want to be those, because, you know, like, when you read stories about, like, the hypocrites, and, like, they're, they're going to be in a fight forever because they pretend to be Muslim, and for whatever reason, in their heart, there's no true belief, and the characteristics. And I started to fit some of those characteristics, like, perfectly. And I'm saying to myself, damn, like, I don't want to be that person, right? So that was, like, a transition for me. But at the same time, people thought that, oh, well, you just changing because this and that, and... Like, it, it, was, it was really difficult to, like, break away from those negative aspects and even some of those people. Like, there's a lot of people who don't speak to me because I don't party or I don't do this or I don't do that. And, but one of the g good things is that if you display integrity, Allah will do either one of two things. He will either bring, he will either make you in a good example for those people or he'll just replace those people with better people. So I had the opportunity to be somewhat of a good example for others and the people who who couldn't accept the fact that I was improving Allah replaced those with better people and some of those people are right here on this panel so mashallah for that yeah. Can I, can I, uh, can man, I, you don't ever talk for two seconds. Can I, can I add something? Yeah. No, I, I just wanted to say something because uh, sometimes these stories can be very negative. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> but no, alhamdulillah, you know, I come from a community, like I said earlier, you know, where most of the people were Muslim. So I didn't have the same reception when I accepted Islam and I would come home and talk to the people about the fact that I was Muslim. And, and I'm saying this to, to say to you all um, that, that we have to appreciate the power of Islam and, and, and the respect that people have for Islam, that even in the lifestyles that they're leading, the way that they look to us, right, to us as examples, right? Um, so we have to be mindful of that, inshallah ta'ala, that we, we sometimes have to brace ourselves for being rejected, but, but again, like you said, that we have to be mindful that there are people who are now starting to look toward us as leaders. So inshallah, just, that was two seconds. <laughs> Um, so I, be, I was about to pledge Alpha Phi Alpha and cross the burning sands um, and go to Morehouse, if you can believe it or not. Um, yeah, that's a long story. Because <laughs> Spellman was there. But I, um, I converted to Islam uh, the night before I became Muslim. You know, I was high, was with my boys. 
But before I became Muslim, I'd say I started reading the Quran. I had this girlfriend, and her uncle was actually Muslim. It's crazy. The guy that the drive by was Muslim. The girl's uncle were Muslims. Mm -hmm. Allah guides us in, in very different fashions. Mm -hmm. Really, I mean, you know, you never know where the blessing is. So she would actually tell me, because I, I stopped eating pork. Right, you know, like Big Daddy Kane said, no pork on my force, strictly fish on my dish. You know? <laughs> so I was, I was exposed. No, I mean, but we have to be honest, we have to respect the power of popular culture to shape constructs in the mind. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm being funny, but I'm being serious as cancer too. <laughs> that really, you have to understand the power of popular culture. Right, and that there was a generation of early night, I call them the Das FX generation, of a liege of brothers and sisters that became Muslim in the 90s because of hip hop. And it's a reality, right? So I, I, uh, I became Muslim, but before I became Muslim, because I was listening to these songs, I was like, well, we're not supposed to eat pork. So I said, I'm gonna stop eating pork. And then, and then alcohol, stop drinking the, 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 the 30 ounces. And then, and, and then it was the big battle was that, that chronic um, uh, marijuana. So I, I basically um, said, you know, this is the last real hurdle. And then the girls, like I think everybody else said. So alhamdulillah, I stopped smoking weed. Uh, it was like six months before I became Muslim. Actually, I thought I was Muslim. I didn't know about Shahada. I didn't know about five prayers. I, I just read the Quran. I said, I believe in it. Um, so I tell people, I took Shahada in the restroom, man. Mm -hmm. and, and then this girl that I was messing with, um, <laughs> she was telling me, you're not a Muslim. And I was like, what do you mean I'm not a Muslim? And she's like, well, my uncle is a Muslim. First of all, white boys can't be Muslims. <laughs> Secondly, Muslims don't drink and smoke weed, and they ain't got girlfriends. Mm -hmm. So like she actually, even though she was not a Muslim, she was like crucial in helping me realize like this is something real. So I slowly, I slowly stopped doing those things, and I became Muslim in November of 92, alhamdulillah. But I was still DJing, and I'm sure you can relate. I had like 5,000 records, grocery crates full of records, and that's how I made my livelihood. And one thing I want to encourage you about new Muslims, and I, I'm not, I don't want to take too much time from the brothers and sisters here, but in the fifth chapter of the Quran, and even in the seventh chapter of the Quran, and in the books of fiqh, you find that the new Muslims are given a lot of leeway. So, for example, if you go to penal law in classical books, like let's say the Maliki school, so the concept of uh, apostasy, you'll find that Khalil, he says, إِلَّا مَنْ أَسْلَمَ حَادِثًا He says, except for the one who just became Muslim. Zina, they say, except for the one who just became Muslim. Apostasy, except for the one who just became Muslim. Thievery, except for the one who just became Muslim. Why? Because they haven't had enough time to, to, to as she talked about, simply living around Muslims has such an important impact on you, right? So one thing I would, and then and even in the fifth chapter of the Quran, we talk about the creedal problems that we run in sometimes getting called, you know, non-Muslims and fasics and people of bidah and all that stuff that we had to go through. In the fifth chapter of the Quran, just reflect on the, the disciples of Christ when they ask him a question which the Salafis and the Ash'aris and the Sufis and even the Catholics agree is kufr. And that is, they ask him, can God send a table from the heavens? It is theologically unacceptable for a believer to ask, can God do something? Because God is qadr ala kulli shay. But did Isa turn to the Hawarin and say, you're kufar? Did he, did he expel them from Islam? And Imam Al-Qurtubi says that, that Isa's response to them was predicated on the fact that they just became Muslim. They hadn't had time to understand the upper echelons of, of Aqidah. The same thing in the seventh chapter of the Quran, the followers of Moses ask him, Can you make for us idols like the homies in, in Egypt had? He, Moses didn't say to them, you're kuffar and you're not from Ahli Sunnah. He said, innukum qawmun tajhaloon, you're ignorant people. Mm. So the ulama said, here people should be given time, man, to understand the deen. So I was DJing and I was, that was when Dre's first, you know, when Snoop came out. <laughs> and I remember I was DJing at a, at a university and I was playing, you know, girls ain't nothing, you know, that one. <laughs> I was playing that song and it wasn't girls. And then it was time for Maghrib. And I was like, man, how the heck am I playing this song and I'm praying Maghrib? Mm -hmm. So one thing we should respect is the ability for Islam to slowly transform people. And, and, and really the best change is a change itself, 
you know, initiated and comes through introspection. So I remember I was DJing, and literally I was like crying, because like, man, how, like, what the brother was saying, I don't want to be a hypocrite, I'm playing Dre? You know, not censored Dre? With young Snoop? And these people I had getting down, you cutting it up, boy, that white boy got skills and everything. And then it's time for Salah, and I go play Maghrib. I'm like, I got to play the extended remix, because I got to go make Salah. Right? And Allah says, Salah keeps away from what? From Fahsha and Munkar. And so after that, I was like, you know what? I'm through with this, man. I like, I'm playing I can't, country now. I can't destroy. <laughs> you know, I can't destroy families with it. So, so, but it took me, it took me almost a year to stop that stuff. Yeah. And also, the, the second week after I became Muslim, my best friend got shot in the back of the head with a Glock 9 from a Great Street Crip. Um. So my friends were like, yo, you got to come. They didn't know I was Muslim either, like the marriage situation. They were like, no, you got to come to the funeral. So, of course, I ran into some of our Salafi brethren who were like, you can't go to the church and you'll become a Kafir if you go to the church. And then, then I ran into the kind of the liberal guys and they were like, you can even go worship in the church. And I just... <laughs> But then I asked my heart, and I was like, you know, that's my boy. Like, he got shot. So I went to the funeral, and then being in the gang, what happens after one of the homies gets smoked? We finna roll out on some fools. So they were like, look, so you got the car, I had a car. They were like, we'll go steal the car. You come over, we got the straps, we need to blast on these fools. Which means, sorry, you know, we need to get together and shoot somebody. <laughs> so I was there, and I was like, my heart was just like pounding, right? And I had no real Muslim, I didn't have a Muslim I could go to the cha-cha in the mosque and be like, yo, I'm finna roll up on this fool, yo. Can you like, <laughs> help me, right? So what happened was, I went, who do you think I went to? The brother from where? From Marcy. I went straight to that brother. And I said, look, man, I'm about to blow up my best friend. I saw him, like all this plastic surgery in his face and you know, it was J-Dog, that was my boy. And instinctively, I need to do something, but Religiously, I know I'm not supposed to do it. And he was like, look, you know, you gotta sit down, we gotta talk this out. So, one thing that helped me when I converted though, is that a lot of the bloods in my community, all of us became Muslim. Around an eight year period, about eight month period. One of my best friends became Muslim. So what we did is we had like this little convert. Till now, it's not Imam Suhaib Web. They're like, man, ain't Imam Suhaib Web, man. <laughs> but, but those brothers are the brothers that you know, I can trust, but mm. luckily we had that, that, that resource. And I'll be honest, when I left Oklahoma and went to MCA in California, which is one of the biggest masjids in America, I'm lonely there now. Because mm. I, I don't have that element anymore of those guys that I became Muslim with and that relationship where if unfortunately I had to go blast on someone, which I hope I won't, I could actually find someone that would even be able to understand and tell me, you can't shoot somebody, man. You know, you're a Muslim now. So I think one thing that we, we said is that we're like babies, but at the same time, we're like teenagers the first day of high school. Socially, we are inept. We're terrified. We're scared that we're not going to be accepted by the community. Everybody says takbir, but when we say, can I marry your daughter, they say peace. Right? <laughs> and, that, and that's... So they yeah. say, you know, when you want to marry their daughter, it had unto a book of faqatila in the hell na qaidum. When you ask him about that, they say, as like the, the Israelites said to Moses, you know, go and fight with your Lord, we'll watch you. Mm. And, and until now, the African American brothers who convert to Islam are facing an, an unbelievable difficulty with racism that we don't want to talk about in our community, man. Mm. And, and even white people, when we find our, our community acts like white people, but when Ken want to marry their daughter, they don't like white people. It's just, it gets really hard for us and confusing. And we, that's something that's not talked about. Yeah, subhanAllah. <laughs> so we had, just because I made a Twitter plea before, I got like 25 Twitter questions now. Um, this one's from somebody whose Twitter handle is NYCOZZ. NYC Oz. What is one thing that you think non-converts, non-converts? <laughs> That's a, I've never heard that before. What is one thing that you think, you know, it's interesting how people identify themselves as they go through conversations like this, right? It's, it's really interesting, and I'm not going to waste time kind of talking out my thoughts because they're not really coherent on this right now. 
But really, like, have you ever called yourself a non-convert? You know what I'm saying? Right? And look at what compels you to call yourself a non-convert, NYCOZZ. <laughs> So, what is one thing that you think non-converts take for granted the most about Islam? Please. I got this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. I got this one. Well, no, I mean, I, I could give you like 30 examples, but for the sake of time, I'm going to give you one. So, Eid. I'm going to tell you right now, Eid. Um, and, and there's several reasons, but the one I really want to emphasize to all of you is that, like, you all have Eid, and you've had Eid your whole life, and you grew up with Eid, alhamdulillah. And the thing is, is that you usually have families to go home to when you have Eid, and you usually have a huge feast when you have Eid, and you usually, you know, give gifts, and you, you, you have these attaches that you've had in these, uh, since you were a kid. And that's not necessarily the case for us, brothers and sisters at this table. You know, Eid can, for me, alhamdulillah, I've always been blessed with people saying, Megan, if you want to come to our house for Eid, Megan, come over, we'll serve you lamb. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I'll graciously eat it. And, um, but, but my point is, is that some brothers and sisters don't have that. They don't have that. And I just, I want to tell you one thing that was just so powerful for me. One sister, uh, this last Eid, you know, I know her, and I, but I don't know her that well. And she gave me a little gift, and I don't know how to tell you how profound that little gift really meant to me. Mm. So just to tell you again, like Muslims, we, we take for granted Eid, and um, and all the things that come with it. So just remember that. Right. So I, I guess my my one response to that is knowledge. Um, the one thing that I get questioned about a lot, well called on a lot, is knowledge. Whenever I talk to a Muslim who, um, who was born into Islam and they know that I'm a convert and, and we talk about anything that has to do with Islam, the assumption is that I don't know or that I don't know better than them. Um, and, and, and I think that that is it's really insulting and I get that a lot whenever I say something to someone and they find out, they, they don't do that until they find out that I, that I converted to Islam and um, that's one thing that, because I found that a lot of people are actually very ignorant of Islam and, and, and don't study and learn as much as they should and they take for granted that what they know culturally is actually Islam and, 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 and in talking to them Saying that the Messenger وسلم, said this, or that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says this, is different from saying, "But this is what my uncle did, or my grandma did, or my father did, or how my mother taught me how to pray." Mashallah. <laughs> I mean, and it's, it's astounding how, how frequently you find it. Alhamdulillah, on a good note, I had a sister actually call me um, one night after berating me, after spending 45 minutes telling me about how I was a convert and how I didn't know better than her. She actually went in to her imam and, and proposed a question to him as if her friend, you know, this, I got a friend who said, right? <laughs> And he said exactly what I said to her. And he said, and you need to tell your friend, da 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 and she is this, and she is that, and if, you, if your friend believes this, then she needs to come to class. I mean, his response to her was, was so poignant that she actually called me back to apologize and said, you know what, I'm sorry. You know, I took for granted that you didn't know this or you didn't know that. And, and my imam said exactly what you said and use the same evidence that you use. So, so we need to be mindful of that, that, that number one, study Islam, and number two, don't take for granted that someone knows or does not know something based upon how long they've been Muslim, where they grew up, or what have you. We gotta be mindful of that. There we go. Shake Sahib and then Musa. Just one thing I wanted to add is also you got to start supplicating on the minbar for your converts mm -hmm. uh, and their parents and their friends and their families. I mean, it's one thing when you're already socially lonely, but then when you go to the, I mean, I remember once I prayed Tarawee behind this brother and I could understand Arabic then. And he went into like this hour long spill about the Americans. This is of course pre 9-11. And, you know, send stones on their houses and tidal waves and fire and all that. And I, I was like, I will have that home, you know, or guide them, right? So I think sometimes when you supplicate, like, I remember once a brother told me to do it, so I did it. And I say, you know, may Allah bless the families of the converts. 
may Allah make the converts a source of guidance for their, their parents and their friends. Mm. And the sister came and she was crying. Mm. And the brother told me that, and she's like, man, this is the first time anyone ever prayed for us, man. Like, I actually feel like I'm part of the sermon. Yes. Whereas I've, I've constantly been kind of like having all these problems and issues, and the community doesn't even pray for me. Mm. So, so I think that it goes back to what he was saying. Everyone asks us to pray for them. But we're like, man, we have more skeletons in the Smithsonian. <laughs> and, and, and then, you know, just praying for the converts and their parents, asking them, you know, not are your mother and father Muslim, when do they convert? That drives me crazy, right? But just how are your parents doing? You know, how is your family? But supplicating really on the mimbar and halaqat and stuff, I think, is, is very crucial uh, for us. So we're going to do Musa and then Marlene, um, and then we might have to wrap up. And no, I'm sorry, and Whitney. Yeah. And Lisa. <laughs> One thing you got to realize at the Islamic Center at NYU, I don't really get to make any decisions, right? <laughs> Even though I'm the executive director of the center, I just get told all the time how things go. So, you know, basically what I said, we could just forget. <laughs> and what we're going to actually do is we'll go Musa and Whitney and Lisa and then Marlene. So if you want to sit for a second, because I'm sorry. Yeah. One of the things that I know for a fact that a lot of people who are born Muslim take for granted is the fact that they have Muslim parents. Like, this is a blessing from Allah that a lot of you, like, completely disregard. Like, I hear people, they complain about their parents. Oh, my parents are this. My parents are that. Like, are you nuts? Like, Allah gave you parents that are upon Tawheed. Yeah. And no matter what their flaws are, when they die, you have the opportunity to ask Allah to forgive them. Yes, I don't have that opportunity. My father died before I became Muslim. And I have to psychologically and emotionally prepare for the fact that it's very likely that my mother will die as a non-Muslim. Mm. And when we hear the stories of the Prophet about his parents not dying upon Tawheed and by his uncle who he cared for so much, and even his uncle who tried to kill him, Abu Lahab, he loved his family. And these people died upon shirk and kufr. And there was nothing he could do about it. And even the verse where Allah says, you cannot guide who you love, right? And that's a very, that's something heavy to swallow, to know that you can't ask Allah for, uh, to, for forgiveness for a person after they die. That's heartbreaking. And when I hear people who have parents who are born Muslim, don't you ever uh, 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 take that for granted. Don't you ever be ungrateful for having Muslim parents. That is one of the single most blessings that Allah has ever given to you. Honor that and respect that always. Whitney. It, it, it's not just, um, it's not just like your parents, right? Just think of your siblings, you know? It, it breaks my heart to think that even with my brother or, you know, close people that this, it could just be you. And, um, it's very difficult because just think right like you go home I went home for Christmas for example and you know it's very like a warm time like all of your relatives are there and of course you're not thinking like oh man like day, you know when this all ends like it's just gonna be me but you know there are moments when you're at home and as a convert you have to you know there's just certain things that, sorry let me say, if there's certain things as a Muslim community you just kind of take as norms right like, we're not going to have dogs in the house. Like, we're not going to do this. But for some reason, like, when I came home for Thanksgiving, um, and then, like, again for Christmas, my mom had two dogs and my brother had a dog. And I was like, great. So, um, I mean, they're cute, you know. And, like, someone gave a khutbah recently that talked about the Prophet was them, like, protecting puppies. And I was like, okay, so, you know, they're not as bad. Okay, like, I'm normally, like, a fish person. Like, I can deal with fish, okay? <laughs> So, um, anyway, like, my brother let the dog in my room. I was like, come on, guys. Like, my room is the one place, like, no pets. So, um, he left the dog in there and, you know, did its business. And I was so, I felt so violated. And um, no one understood Fick. Like, how do you explain, you know, they love their dogs. Like, that's their best friend. And they treat them like they're my siblings or something. How do you explain Fick to them? And they're like, oh, Whitney, that's just like Islam or something. And I'm so offended. And I felt very isolated, especially being in a part of the country where there's no subway for me to just like jump on a train and like 
you know, take a breather, you know. So just just be grateful that, you know, you have this kind of safe space at home. You have people who, like, who love you dearly, who are praying for you, and who you could possibly spend eternity with. Like, that's, that's so precious, you know? Sorry, I just, really quick before Lisa goes, I mean, the last two speakers said something that's really important, and I want to chime in as a non-convert on this. <laughs> think about all of that, and then think about what it feels like when they're told, you can't marry my son or daughter because you're not from our country. And you want to conceptualize this. Because people are not one-dimensional, they have many layers. And they come with their experiences, they come with their emotions, and the way you treat them is going to have a big impact on how they react to you and how they move forward in their lives. And so two of your brothers and sisters right now just said to you, it's hard for us to deal with the fact that our family is not Muslim. And then if you say to them, well, we understand, but you can't be a part of our family because of something nobody really asked you about in the first place in terms of who your parents were or where you would be born into the world, what do you think it's going to make them feel like? So don't do that. <laughs> like, for real. Don't do it. Because it hurts. And hurting people is haram. Like seriously, and you want to think about it like that. You don't have to be a convert to be a baby in your Islam. And many non-converts are babies in their Islam too. And it starts from the way we treat one another. So think about it. Um, I would just say. Um, I think something that people who are raised in a Muslim family take for granted um, is that you have the freedom and the ability to express your Islam like the way you want to. You know, if you're a brother and you have like a long beard, mashallah, like nobody's gonna, if you walk into your house, nobody's gonna say, you know, chop that thing off or shave it off. If you're a sister and you choose to wear hijab, you know, inshallah, nobody's telling you, you know, take it off, you don't wear it. Um, whereas, you know, hijab is very important to me and I, love wearing it but when I go home I take it off because I don't want my mother to start crying again because I'm wearing it and then I'm doing something that is upsetting her and so I'm trying to you know inshallah find like a balance where I can potentially make this work and still be expressing my Islam the way I want to without making my mother upset because that is also something that makes me upset and so the, the fact that you have the ability to do that I think is something that a lot of Muslims take for granted and you know inshallah may Allah make it easy for us to express our Islam the way we want to Marlene. Assalamu alaikum. I'm also a convert uh, from Chile, so I wasn't raised here. And <laughs> thank you. And one thing that nobody touched upon is learning Arabic. We pray in Arabic, and we have to memorize the surahs in Arabic. And nobody has taught me Arabic. So um, I think we need to have somebody to help us with that. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I have a friend who taught me, I know, about six surahs or seven that I memorized, and he taught me over the phone. He would repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, and I wrote it in half Spanish, half English, whatever it sounded to me, kind of like, and that's how I memorized it. But it's really hard, and I would love to speak Arabic. And sometimes I hear that some Muslims that speak Arabic and can read it haven't memorized any surahs. Stuck for Allah. And the last thing is um, when we have a khutbah and the imams speak Arabic terms, sometimes they skip and they don't explain it. And I'm just hanging like a light bulb. <laughs> Thank you. Salam alaikum. So, Mariam, um, and the sister, I'm sorry, sister, I don't know your name. I apologize. Sarah. 
Nazira. Nasira? Nasira. So, yeah. <laughs> Questions. First, uh, Imam Saheb, uh, you had said something about um, African American brothers facing a lot of discriminations. I was just wondering why you specified brothers instead of just saying in general. Um, and then my second question was um, that there are three um, women on the panel, but I think that um, overall it's actually the majority of converts are women. I don't know if like we know that for sure. So I was just wondering, and obviously like the gender dynamics in the Muslim community can be interesting to say the least. So I'm just wondering if like you guys can comment on what that's been like. First and foremost, actually I served as an imam on the African American community in St. Louis uh, about 13 years ago. Um, and then moving to California, um, a number of brothers who live actually, if you can believe it, in Silicon Valley, right? Who would think that people in Silicon Valley would have these kind of issues as Muslims? So constantly running into my brothers who have been turned away, have been actually told to their face it's because they're black. Uh, or basically, I remember actually I forced a marriage in my community between a Pakistani girl and an African American brother. And when I went to meet her father, it was like a Freudian slip. The first thing he's told to me is, I'm not a racist, I don't have any racial problems, but no. And then, you know, talking to him and seeing it as a constant, especially amongst the brothers who are African American, uh, that was my experiences. And I, it, working in a community also that was predominantly African American. And I had a brother last year, a very, very gifted brother. He works actually for like Facebook. Um, He's making six figures. He's a Stanford graduate from the west side of Chicago. He came into my office and he dresses, you know, he dresses like he's, he's an urban Bedouin, right? So he, he has the urban gear. And he was like, he just stopped right in front of my door. And I was like, you know, wow, who's his brother, right? And he was like, Imam. I said, he said, am I haram? And I was like, are you haram? Like, what do you mean? He said, like, no, am I haram? He's serious. Like, it's funny, but it's really, I mean, like, like Khaled is saying, man, words carry weight, man. Like, when people bash Kufar, and your parents are Kufar, and your brothers are Kufar, and your uncles are Kufar, my mother, my mother gives money to Muslim organizations, man. Mm. Don't tell me that my mother is, like, some crazy pharaonic kafir. You know, my mother, when I graduated from Ezhar, she's like, my son went to the oldest university in the world. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, it's not, it, 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 these things hurt us. I, I think it's good to have, like, she's almost therapeutic when you're hearing people just destroying non-Muslims. But I, I have family members, like, my mother used to wake me up for Fajr, man. Mm -hmm. I was an imam once, and I missed Fajr, and I tried to, like, not let her hear it. And she was like, what type of imam are you? <laughs> And then I said to her, what type of creation of Allah are you? You worship more than one God. She's like, I don't hear it. But I think sometimes we don't understand that our words, like I appreciate what my brother earlier said, they threw you off for like three years. Just words, right? Kalima sayya is like shajara sayya. Mm -hmm. So that brother was in my doorway and he was just distraught. And this is a graduate from Stanford. This is not somebody that's not got it up, up here, got, got it together. He's like, I'm going back to the west side of Chicago to start like NGOs to help the community. I mean, he's not a dumb guy. He's asking me, am I haram? So I was like, you're not haram, you're Adami. You know, you're a human being. He said, well, whenever I go to the mosque, people tell me that I'm haram because of how I dress. And he was like, I don't really feel that it's an issue of how I dress, but it's more an issue of my color. So my experience has, has, has been with that, predominantly. I also, I also wanted to say that um, from my perspective, I thought converting to Islam was like a revolutionary act. And I mean, you know, I felt like the prophet's example was to like abolish racism, right? To abolish that as like a primary factor, like tribalism or like, case like all these different ways that we see it expressed in society and especially like as an african-american woman i felt like you know i can't i could never be jewish because i felt like they you know they're my they're our brothers but i felt like i couldn't be jewish because they're too separate like something about them has never been inclusive in my life as an african-american woman christianity um and catholicism for example i, I didn't want images and i thought you know, Islam just made sense because it was just acknowledging that there's one God, and I I just thought the Prophet's example was revolutionary. So to see like Muslims who are so like tribalistic or who can't like think for themselves, it drives me nuts. And 
Um, I think also just the experience of African Americans in this country, I just have like, I, I embrace my heritage fully and I just think that it's everyone who's in this country's heritage to, um, to just not accept racism. It's just really, it disgusts me. Um, so I hope that, you know, Michelle, I don't mean to be so negative about it, but um, it's just not, it's just not nice, you know. Um, yeah, racism is just, it's, it's a form of arrogance. And, and we know that like arrogance is like following shaitan. So I just really think people should be very careful about, um, you know, how they prioritize, um, you know, who they associate with or, you know, who they marry. Like, I just think that's really dangerous. Um, and we have a revolutionary example in the prophet to oppose this, you know. So we're gonna we're gonna make these two questions Wait. the last two questions because we went over by a lot. Khalid, can I answer the girl question? Sure, girl. All right, cool. <laughs> so uh, I think that's a wonderful question, and then there's many. And the one that I want to focus on actually is when I um, growing up, I was always pushed up to be a leader. Always pushed up. I was always told that I could, you know stand up in front of a crowd and speak my mind and that was you know alhamdulillah that's like something that's like just this amazing thing that I that I was pushed and not to say I mean the people that I was around alhamdulillah they pushed when I became Muslim they pushed me to be a leader as well but it's like I felt like it wasn't always allowed for me to be a leader in the faith like I mean but from what I could see in the text, like I have this text in front of me, like it says, the believers, both men and women, are in charge and responsible for one another. They enjoin the doing of what is right and forbid in what is doing wrong. That's, that, that says, like, right there, you know, that surah, sorry, 9, verse 71, like that we all have the ability to be leaders. And so, like, I want to give you a, a, just a, a, moder like a modern cultural context to all the women that are out there. A little bit of Madonna, okay? So don't just stand there, just get to it. Strike a pose, there's nothing to it. So on these, on these last two questions, I'm really sorry, but um, if we keep the responses, like, not... Yeah, just go, just go ahead. Do what you got Hi. Assalamu alaikum. Um, sorry. Um, I just really want to tell you, speaking as a convert now, two years, um, thank you. Um, uh, just saying that I, I want to um, emphasize to you that I know that you've lost many a people that you were used to dealing with and it is not easy in any way shape or form to lose the people whom you have had uh, ties to with that being said um, how have you guys um, although with the brother um, the third Oh, with a long beard. I'm sorry, I can't see your name. <laughs> the, um, although you had said poignantly, um, Allah removed the bad and, and replaced it with even better. How is it that you individually, and uh, please keep your answer short, individually have um, <laughs> accepted, accepted um, that, accepted this? And although with the trials, how how have you? dealt with um, even your own family disowning you or your friends leaving you or your how, however how have you handled the grasp of the change how have you handled it and how has it empowered you to treat your fellow converts or non-converts uh, how do you treat them now having being armed with this information and power on how people have perceived you as converts as new Muslims how have you dealt with the the separation of what you were used to how have you dealt with it in in the way islamically that's all that was my question i don't know if that made sense you got yeah, that y'all yeah. got that y'all got that y'all good we clear all right good to answer the question i would just um remind myself and my fellow panelists and all of us just to maintain the proper protocol referring to islamic character as we know um when our mother aisha was asked what was the prophet like? She said his character was the Qur'an. 
So, and we see a slew of examples of how the Prophet Sallam dealt with people in the best of manners, even when they oppressed him. Like we know the example of the person who would throw trash at his doorway, and he went to visit this person on their deathbed, and he asked, where is my gift? Right? So a slew of examples. Even if a person like does you dirty in a sense, or like cuts you off, as a Muslim, we still have an obligation to do what I said earlier, is that what the Prophet Sallam said, that the Muslim is one who protects people from their negative statements and their negative actions. We're not going to be held accountable for other people's negative statements and actions. We're going to be held accountable for our own. Mm. So as, lo as long as we come correct based upon the book and the wisdom, that's all that matters. And Allah will bring people to us, and Allah will remove negative from us. So, Peter, Peter, and then Zinga will have the next question, and then the next we'll wrap one. up. I just wanted to add something really quickly. Um, you know, like I, I know, Khalid and I kind of we've all been talking about like um, very extreme difficulties and and um, you know, you know, people losing all their friends, being being uh, disowned or or. or you know, by their families, and I just wanted to, to just stress this that you know it's not always something that big, and don't just look you know as as non-converts I guess don't just look for big things like that like you know don't assume oh well this uh, brother this sister uh, converted to Islam and they didn't get get kicked out of their house so they're 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 fine. You know, it's it's really like we we said earlier. It's very lonely. You know, before I uh, you know went got to college and like had Muslims around. You know, shout out to the QC uh, in the house. Uh, yeah, they're here. Um, you know, I, I you know there there weren't people around. So you know, just be be aware of that. I mean, you know, I, I don't know how many converts are here today. Like, could you guys raise your hands if you're a convert? It's a lot of people. Mashallah. So. Yeah, definitely. Just, just try to just keep an eye out for people, you know, and, and, and because it's not always the big things. I know that wasn't like the, the main part of the question, but it's not always the big things. A lot of times it's the little things that can be the most, you know, uh, difficult. So, so. Um, so I have a question about, um, you know, so sometimes I guess, and you guys have mentioned this, when, when people become Muslim, like convert to Islam, then you feel like this weight is lifted and you feel like things are so perfect. And I feel like sometimes with converts, and I have this experience with a friend, then it's like you get on this high and it lasts for, I don't know, it could be several months to a year. And then you realize that you still have yourself to deal with and Islam has not erased all of your problems, um, you know, or just which maybe just general problems that people have, like, you know, that you still have to deal with the world. And then for some people then it becomes like, um, maybe they feel let down by this experience that they've had. And um, I have a question because like I have, you know, a friend and who kind of had this experience of converting to Islam and then um, I think she was on this high, you know, and I, you know, we were friends before she was Muslim, and then I think, and then I think she came to a point where whatever happened, I think she was in a relationship, and that let her down, and so she suddenly, you know, she stopped, maybe she stopped practicing, but nonetheless, she's like disconnected from me, and I feel like maybe because maybe she may be in that point where. You know, where maybe she feels like she's not living up to the standard of, of being Muslim, but, you know, like how does, how can a Muslim friend help that friend who is in the position where now they just have to deal with the reality of um, their life and the fact that they may not be doing everything that's correct and they may be going back to that lifestyle, but you're still trying to be the supportive friend who's like, well, you can still connect with me, you can still be my friend, but you don't want to make them have to be a certain way. Like, how can the it's friend help you guys? The world, man. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hey, what are you, what are you how doing? How can a friend to converse who have <laughs> What I say is don't give up on your friend. Right. Hang out with her, take her to the masjid, just keep her in that environment. Because <laughs> if you leave her alone and she goes astray, she starts thinking her own thoughts, she'll she'll you know you got to just keep her around good people and as long as they are around that they'll continue we feed off each other you know and i think that's more important yeah, yeah. I don't know. 
<laughs> Does anybody want to answer really quick? I'll, yeah. just, I, I'll just say one thing is just, you know, kind of to reiterate, and you know, you did say like, um, you know, don't, you know, don't put pressure on people. Um, I remember, I, you know, when I, after I became Muslim, I, uh, you know, after a couple of years, like, I, I didn't really go to my, my masjid. I was a local masjid, mashallah. I'm not saying anything negative about them. You know, it, it was, alhamdulillah, great that it was very close to me, but, um, it was a lot of uh, older people, a lot of like uncles and stuff, and it wasn't, you know, it was a many, many Pakistani masjid, a lot of things in Urdu, and I didn't really have a connection there. It wasn't, you know, I, I loved the deen, but I just didn't feel the connection there. But I had a friend who, was, who called me and be like, yo, man, you got to come to the masjid. And I'm like, I'm sleeping. Like, you didn't even, it's, it's 8 in the morning. I didn't know there was anything going on. Come on, man, what kind of Muslim are you? You got to, you know, that you don't want to do stuff like that. And much like he's a great friend, but, you know, nobody's perfect, right? So, so you know, those those type of things, because Muslims, you know, as no Muslims really need people who can, who we could just, like you said, we could talk to because, you know, it's, we're a lot of times are struggling with, with getting it right and, and, and not just that, but, you know, like we said about family and, and we, we have a lot of things that are, we're upset about or concerned about and are on our mind and, you know, just be someone that they can talk to, you know, like, I mean, you know, we were talking about family before, I, I you know, and, and worrying about, you know, the, our, the, you know, the final destination for our, our parents and our siblings and stuff and, you know, I, I, you know, we all go through that and I try to block it out sometimes. But you know, you get upset, and I remember one day, I was, um, I was, you know, kind of like it was really late at night, and I was like in my room, I was crying, you know, I was praying and making du'a and, and crying about this, and my sister had, I guess she came home late, and she, I'm not, you know, trying to say anything bad about my sister, but she came home late, she was in the other room, and I guess she heard me. I went out to come out to go to the bathroom. She's like, "What are you crying about?" So I was like, "Um, like I don't want to tell you, because I know she's, <laughs> I was crying about, you know, like, are they gonna be in the, you know, in the not, in the fire?" So I'm just like. I, I don't know if I want to tell you. She's like, no, no, come on, tell me, tell me. And I'm like, I was worried. I'm crying because I'm worried about you and mom and dad and, you know, you know where you're going to end up. And she got mad at me. She's like, I can't believe you. Oh, my God. This is what you're crying about? This is so stupid. Oh, my God. Like, and I was like, I was like crying. Like, how can you, you know, so it's like, sometimes you don't have anyone to talk to, you know, like, even, and Muhammad, mashallah, my sister, she's you know, really great, you know, she's always there for me and stuff, but that was something, she, she couldn't relate to me on that, you know, she was just, it's just totally weird for her. So it's very important to, to be someone that, you know, you can, you can be a resource to that person to talk, just to talk to them, and that you, they can, they, you know what they're, you know that Islam, and so you know what, what, how they're feeling about a lot of these things, inshallah. So really, really, yeah, man. Go, go ahead. It'll take, it'll take, it'll take 30 seconds. I can't tell him not right. It's a convert panel. I'm gonna tell a convert to shut up, right? Then I'm just gonna look really hypocritical, you know. So, right? You shall let it be worth it. I was joking. Please take your time. So to answer your question, it's it's general advice, but it's simple advice, and I would say that your friend's pain and confusion are real and ought to be recognized and validated as as any sort of pain you know pain that is suppressed doesn't go away it just manifests itself in in, in other ways and um, that's all I'll say about that in light of your question the fact that you're trying to help your friend I just wanted to recognize that that you're trying um, I recently had the pleasure of sitting in on a lecture with Sheikh Faraz Rabbani, may Allah preserve him, and he said that the prophetic attitude is essentially, and I'm humbly paraphrasing what he said, is essentially that 95% of the people in this world are really trying their best and they don't really mean any harm to anyone. So I just wanted to acknowledge the fact that you're all trying your best and uh, we're going through something you're all going through your own things, but inshallah this should unite us as a, as a community. And that's, that's all. So as we, we wrap up this session, I apologize that it went over. I'm pretty sure, alhamdulillah, that everyone benefited from it. And one of the things that we want to focus on, aside from the primary